to the next. In the first service, we sang a, a very familiar hymn. You know it as well. To God be the glory. I know it. I've sung it countless times. I sung it on the very first Sunday that I was in church after I came to know the Lord. And I thought, that's, a, that's really good. I didn't know of any idea of what it meant. But this morning, first line of the second verse jumped out to me. O oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood. You know where that came from? Our text for this morning. How wonderful it will be as we look at the doctrine of redemption. We've been telling you that as we've begun the book of Ephesians, that the first major paragraph is verses 3 through 14 in chapter 1, and it is one long Greek sentence. It's just impossible by anybody sane to turn this into one English sentence, but our translation makes it into six, and you can make sense of the, uh, the, the portions of it, and we're going to take one of those this morning. In, um, in, in one large bite. Here's the theme of this section, Ephesians 1.3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. So think of that verse as the trunk of the tree, and then verses 4 through 14 are the branches and the leaves that fan out from that trunk. In other words, this is the expansion of every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Verses 4 through 6, where we've visited the last two Lord's Days, deal with election. That's about the past, and that is mainly rooted in God the Father. Verses 7 through 10, our venue for this morning, deals with the doctrine of redemption. That talks primarily about the present, but not exclusively, as you'll see. And it, of course, is rooted in the Son. When we get to 11 through 14, that's going to deal with our inheritance. That talks about the future and is very much related to the Holy Spirit. Now, we took the doctrine of election in um, two bites, verses uh, 4 through 6. And I trust that you will uh, review those as you need to. We're not going to go back there today. But today our study shifts to the emphasis from the choice of God the Father in eternity past to the work of God the Son when He invaded history and what His work has done for us. The key word is redemption. And we're going to look at it in six parts. Um, don't worry, we have plenty of time. Tomorrow's a holiday. We'll stay until we're done, all right? No, you, we'll, we'll finish in appropriate time. The meaning of redemption, the person of redemption, the price of redemption, the result of redemption, the source of redemption, and the outcome of redemption. <laughs> now, before we jump into the text, I want to talk a little bit about the meaning of redemption itself. So I'll help define the concept, and then you'll see how it's specifically described in our text. Um, to understand redemption, take your mind to the marketplace. And I don't mean Albertsons. Think of a, <coughs> of a place like more common in other cultures, an, an open air market, all kinds of things for sale. And if you were to deal with the first century concept of redemption, you'd have to think of a marketplace that included a slave market where slaves were bought and sold like animals. To get a slave from the market, all you had to do was show up, choose the person, and pay the price. Now, to describe this concept biblically, theologically, I need to let you know there's at least five New Testament words that relate to the concept of redemption. The first is the one that we get transliterated directly into English as the word agora. Now, where I grew up, there was a town on the fringes called Agora. And I thought, wow, when I learned a Greek word, why'd they name that place marketplace? Well, that's what the word means. It means, it means marketplace. And the verb form of it means to buy or sell in the marketplace. 
Uh, it's the common word for everyday transactions. Now, if you hear it in our world, you usually hear not just the word agora, you hear the word phobia attached to it. Because what is agoraphobia? It's the fear of being in a place like a marketplace where there's bedlam, where, where you're not in control. So it, it's, a, it's someone that has a, a, a fear of that kind of uh, public place and public exposure. May that help you uh, remember what the word means. Let me show you two places uh, in the writings of the Apostle Paul where he uses this word, and it'll help you be ready for Ephesians 1. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6.20, For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Bought with a price, that's what the word means, uh, agorazo. 1 Corinthians 7.23, You were bought with a price, do not become slaves of men. So both of those are saying, God bought you. You were formerly a slave to something else. You were a slave to sin. Now He is your Lord. You are His slave. You've been set free from your bondage to, to, to sin to be able to serve the Lord of glory. There's another place that is um, an amazing use of this word, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Peter writes, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. One of the characteristics of false teachers is to deny the lordship of Jesus Christ, that he is the, the, the master, the one who is in control. Now, the second word for redemption is a strengthened form of that word that means to buy up or to buy out of or to rescue from loss. This is the word that was used for purchasing a slave for the purpose of giving him or her freedom. Not surprisingly, it's used for our spiritual redemption. The third word used in this um, theme of words means to release by paying a ransom. It's related to the word that means the ransom price. In the case of our redemption, you're going to see that the price is the death of Jesus Christ. The fourth word in this family is uh, one that means the act of releasing some, someone by ransom. That too describes what Christ accomplished for us. The fifth word is an, an even stronger form. And this is the word used in Ephesians 1.7. It includes all of those ideas rolled together, plus the added thought of an even greater manifestation of our redemption in the future in God's presence. So I said redemption is the work of Christ in history, and we stand redeemed in Him now. But there's a future aspect. So to steal some of our own thunder from a couple of weeks from now, if you look ahead to Ephesians 1.13 and 14... You were sealed in Him with the Holy Spirit of promise who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of His glory. There is a future aspect of our redemption when we're set free from what Paul calls in Romans the, 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 body, or the body of this death. Or there's also Ephesians 4.30 where he wrote, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So the basic meaning of redemption is that you've been bought out of the slave market where you were a slave to sin and now as a redeemed one, you are guaranteed a future of freedom from sin in the presence of God. So that's the meaning. Now, let's move to our text and look at the person of redemption. Ephesians 1.7. In Him, that's a person that refers back to the beloved one at the end of verse 6. In Him, we have redemption through His blood. It's connected to a person. Obviously, the Redeemer is Jesus Christ. Our redemption is in Him. Notice, too the innocent looking little words, we have. Uh, they look innocent enough and they are innocent, but 
they emphasize an important truth. It's a present tense in Greek. So I, I told you we're sealed for the future day of redemption, but also in Christ now, we have this redemption, present tense, continual possession of redemption. So that's our key word for today, redemption. It's all wrapped up in Christ. Christ bought us out of slavery to sin and made us free to live in Him and glorify God. Our redemption is in Christ, and it is among the things called every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. This is a huge part of the solution to our sin problem. We've been redeemed, no longer a slave to sin. Romans 3, 23 and 24, we love to, when we present the gospel, read Romans 3, 23. A lot of times we don't read on to verse 24. That passage says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's part of the gospel because the good news doesn't mean anything unless you know the bad news that it's the answer to. And the bad news is we're all alienated from God because of our sin. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace, what? Through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Remember, as I said, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, now we're just branching out to see all of the stuff that is part of that collection of every spiritual blessing. Now, you know the meaning of redemption. Now, you know the obvious person of redemption. It's Jesus Christ. But what about the price of redemption? Back to verse 7. In Him we have redemption through His blood the forgiveness of our transgressions. Through His blood tells us the price of redemption. Through is the translation of a preposition that means the instrument by which something is accomplished. Redemption is accomplished through His blood. Only through the blood, which refers to the death, only through the death of Jesus Christ is redemption accomplished. His blood is a euphemism for his death. It's crucial to understand what the New Testament means when it so often speaks so highly about the blood of Christ or His blood. Now, there's no reason to believe that the blood that flowed in Jesus' veins was different from what you and I know as blood or what flows in our veins. There's no reason to believe that His blood was chemically different than ours. I have heard some preachers say that every drop of Jesus' blood that was shed at the cross was gathered up and is in heaven as a perpetual memorial. And that's not what it's talking about. It's not precious blood in that sense. If Jesus was working in His father Joseph's, His earthly father Joseph's carpenter shop and He made a, a mistake and uh, cut his finger and dripped blood on someone, that wouldn't save them, wouldn't heal them, uh, wouldn't do anything except cause a stain. Now, you can have your lunch discussion over, well, would a perfectly sinless one ever make a mistake and cut his finger? I, I don't know, all right? Maybe his dad made a mistake and cut Jesus' finger. Uh, you know, it'll work, all right? The illustration will work. The point is, it's not the physical blood. The significance of the expression, the blood of Christ, is that it refers to His death. Blood is a Hebrew equivalent of the phrase to shed blood, which is a way of describing death by violence as opposed to a natural death. Therefore, redemption through His blood means redemption accomplished by his violent death in which his blood was, if you will, spilled as a sacrifice. All of those Old Testament bloody sacrifices pictured over and over and emphasized countless tens of thousands of times that sin had to be atoned for by the giving of a life. There's a verse you need to know, remember this reference or, and or memorize this verse. 
It's in the book of Leviticus, smack dab in the middle of all of those regulations about all of those sacrifices. Leviticus 17.11 says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. You would come to the priest. You would bring the animal for the sacrifice. The priest would kill the animal, slaughter the animal. And then some of the blood would be sprinkled on the altar. That was the way of showing that that blood covered your sin. That was the picture of Christ in every blood sacrifice. But always the animal had to die. You couldn't bring your perfect pet lamb and bring it to the priest and have him, you know, like a diabetic does, you know, prick his paw and get a drop of blood and put it on the altar and then put a Band-Aid on the paw and wait for the next sacrifice. No, the animal had to be given because it's the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement for sin. I don't know if they still use the slogan, but the Red Cross used to say, give life, give blood. They probably had no idea what great theology they were stating, even if they didn't apply it anywhere near the right way. The price of your redemption was the death of Jesus Christ. And because of who He is, the, the sinless God-man who lived the perfect life, His sacrificial death is special. That's what gives meaning to the term, the precious blood of Christ. So in Ephesians 1.7, in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. Don't get weird about the actual blood that flowed through Jesus' body. Be thankful for His death. Oh, and by the way, you've heard the theme song of the angels in heaven, the one they burst out with when Jesus, the Lamb that was slain, Remember, he comes up to God the Father, the one who sits on the throne, and he, and he takes the scroll that contains all of the revelation of what is going to happen in the unfolding of the, of the day of the Lord. And he takes that, and all of the angels burst out. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the blood and to, or take the book, rather, and to break its seals. For you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You're worthy because you are the Redeemer. So now you know the meaning of redemption, the person of redemption, the price of redemption. Now look at the result of redemption. There's a parallel statement to the word redemption. And when I say that, in this very complicated Greek sentence. It is an exact parallel. Redemption, which is the forgiveness of our trespasses. Verse 7, in Him we have redemption through His blood, comma, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. Trespasses is one of about nine different words in the New Testament to describe sins. Lots of different ways of sinning. There's lots of different ways of describing sin. The usual word for sin, like we saw in Romans 3.23, means to miss the mark. Anything short of perfection. You, you miss the bullseye, it's an archery term. Miss the bullseye, that's a hamartia, that's a, that's a sin. But this one describes sins as um, fa falling to the side or stepping out of bounds another way of describing a sin. Forgiveness comes from a Greek word that means to let go, to send away, or to depart. So forgiveness of sins means releasing or letting go of them as if they had not been committed. There's a wonderful Old Testament illustration of this idea also from the book of Leviticus. This one from the events of the annual Day of Atonement. 
Yom Kippur, if you like to um, lapse Hebrew about it. Leviticus chapter 16, verses 3 through 10, it's all in the context of all the things that the priests had to do to make sacrifices for themselves, for the utensils, for the altar, for the whole place that it was going to be offered. But it also describes two goats. Goat number one then is described in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 15. Then he shall slaughter the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, and bring its blood inside the veil, that's into the Holy of Holies, and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull, there was a bull offered before this, obviously, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. Again, animal had to die, then the blood brought in and sprinkled on the altar symbolically saying, this is offered on behalf of all of these people. Oh, and by the way, here's a little tidbit. That word mercy seat, you know what the mercy seat is? That's the, that's the lid on top of the Ark of the Covenant, that gold-plated lid, and that mercy seat is called a hilasterion, if you translate it into Greek, that's the word that is the Greek, uh, the, the New Testament word for propitiation. That's the sacrifice which is offered, which satisfies the wrath of God. How is the wrath of God satisfied? The blood of the sacrifice is applied on behalf of the worshiper. So that's goat number one, a picture of the death of Christ. Goat number two, down in Leviticus chapter 16, verses 20 through 22. This is a picture of forgiveness. And we have redemption, which is the forgiveness of our trespasses. Okay, here's goat number two, verse 20. When he finishes atoning for the holy place and the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall offer the live goat. Then Aaron shall lay both of his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the sons of Israel and all their transgressions in regard to all their sins, and he shall lay them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who stands in readiness. This is one of the bit players in the events of the Day of Atonement. God just, his job was to stand there until goat number two was ready and all the sins are confessed as the priest lays his hands to identify with that goat. The goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities to a solitary land and he shall release the goat in the wilderness. The guy had to take that goat far away and abandon it. All right. What's that a picture of? Put it together, that's a picture of Christ's work on our behalf. He is the sin sacrifice by means of His death, and He's the one who separated our sins from us. You ever heard of the scapegoat? That's what it is. It's where this comes from. The one who bears all of the sins. You put all the blame on the scapegoat. And if you want to remember which one that is, he's the one that scaped, okay, out into the wilderness. I don't think that's what the etymology is, but you'll remember it that way. And what amazing results come from this. You ever looked at Psalm 103, verse 12? And as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. What a great picture. You, you know, if you start walking east and swimming and boating and whatever, you can go east for the rest of your life. Or you could go west for the rest of your life. This doesn't work if you say north and south. Because if you start going north, you go over a pole, you're headed south. You start going south, you go under a pole, you're headed north. This is the perfect word picture to say, as far as the east is from the west, well, that's infinite. That's the redemption that you have in Christ, pictured in the two goats on the Day of Atonement, 
fulfilled in what Christ did. So there's the meaning, the person, the price, and the result of redemption. Now, let's look at the source of redemption. Verse 7, and again this time into verse 8. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace which He lavished upon it, upon us. The source of redemption is the riches of His grace. Uh, the phrase according to, that's significant because think of a comparison. Imagine two very wealthy people and one gives you something out of his riches. The other one gives you something according to his riches or proportionate to his riches. Which would be more significant? Obviously, according to. The pattern of the extent of forgiveness of God is the inexhaustible storehouse of the riches of His grace. And yes, you probably know the definition of the word grace. It means unmerited favor. This is a case where the Sunday school lesson is actually correct. You can turn the word grace into an acronym for the saying, God's riches at Christ's expense. That's grace. You get what you don't deserve. Mercy is that you don't get what you deserve. Grace is that you get what you don't deserve, which is salvation. Then he says that his grace is lavished on us. I think they picked exactly the right word when they said lavished. It comes from a Greek word that means, if you're talking about a number, to exceed it. If you're talking about a measure of something, it's over and above, in, in, in super abundance. And that's how God's grace comes to us. It comes in overflowing measure. It's, it's, it's boundless. If you were going to write a song about it, you might say it is the marvelous, infinite, matchless grace freely bestowed on all who believe. Why, it is grace greater than all our sin. But don't write the song. Look, turn to hymn number 78. It's already there. Why did they say that? <laughs> They'd read Ephesians chapter 1 and other places. The meaning of redemption, you've been set free from your bondage. The person of redemption is Christ. The price of redemption is His death. The result of redemption is uh, our forgiveness. The source of redemption is God's grace. And now look at the, the outcome of redemption. Pick it up in the middle of verse 8 and we'll read all the way through verse 10. In all wisdom and insight. Okay, let's just let's stop there. Wisdom is the knowledge of spiritual things and the right use of that knowledge. Insight is the earthly application of wisdom. The word insight is related to the word think for how you think. So he says, in all wisdom and insight, he made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His kind intention, which He purposed in Him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the, heaven and, in the heavens and things on the earth. I remember translating this sentence for the first time and just saying, Wow, what a, what a package we have of all these spiritual blessings that are attached to redemption. Look at what this says. There are parallel thoughts in this verse and a half here, or two verses and a half. Uh, parallel thoughts in this expression. His will is parallel to His good pleasure, which is parallel to His purpose. His will implies His sovereign choice. Well, we were chosen Him before the foundation of the world. Now He's working out His will in time. His good pleasure implies what He desires and what He approves or what He likes. And His purpose implies His predetermination. 
So in other words, in Christ, to His redeemed people, God has chosen to reveal by His own desire and predetermination His mystery, His formerly hidden mystery as to the culmination of all things in Christ. He has made known to us the mystery. That means that now in Christ we have revelation of something that wasn't known in Old Testament times. That's what the word mystery means. And the, the book of Ephesians is where the most is written in one place about this mystery, which as we will see it unfold, is all about the church, the body of Christ that has brought together people of all backgrounds, and that includes Jews and Gentiles who had nothing to do with each other, didn't like each other at all. You know, Jews, if they had to go from Jerusalem to Galilee, they would add a whole day to their trip so they could go cross the Jordan River, go up the other side, cross the Jordan River again, so they wouldn't even set foot in the, in the, in the dirt that belonged to the Samaritans. And they were Jewish half-breeds. And they all hated the Gentiles. And the Gentiles didn't have anything to do with it. And he says, in Christ, neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, bond nor free, None of those things matter because there is one redemption for all. If you want a further sniff of what we're going to study in depth later, you might want to go ahead and read Ephesians 3, 1 through 6. Some of you have mentioned you've already had the joy of taking me up on my challenge to read through Ephesians each week as we go or read a chapter a day. Well, you might want to go connect that to what we're saying today. Um, the concept of the mystery that is now revealed, was first introduced by Jesus. Remember the setting? Matthew chapter 12, the, the Pharisees, the leaders of the Jews, made their full public rejection of Jesus. And so it says, from then on, He didn't teach the same way in public. He started speaking in parables, illustrating things to come. And He, he told them, when they asked His disciples asked Him why, He said, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, which is exactly the same as the kingdom of God. There's, there's mysteries about that. Well, what mysteries? Well, you don't know them because they haven't been revealed yet. He gives parables about uh, a time of a kingdom with the kingdom gone, a time that's, that's a, a long period of uh, planting and waiting and reaping, sowing and reaping, and, and, there's, and there's harvesting, and, there's, and it's like bringing in a net full of fish, and some are good and some are bad. That, that's, he's describing something that they didn't know. He began to reveal those mysteries. And then through the Apostle Paul, most of it is revealed. Uh, most of the rest of it is revealed to us. Well, verse 10 in our text is the elaboration of this with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times. That is the summing up of all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. What a fascinating phrase. Administration suitable to the fullness of the times. Well, the fullness of the times, that's the time of Christ. Galatians chapter 4, uh, verse 4 says that Christ came in the, the fullness of time. And then he talks about this word dispensation, uh, I'm sorry, administration suitable to the fullness of the times. If you've ever heard the word dispensation, perhaps you're looking at a, at a King James, they use the word dispensation to translate this word four of the six times that it occurs in the New Testament. But what it actually means is a, a, a managing of things. It comes from a word that's a combination of house and manage. Now, we don't use the word dispensation all that often in our, word, but in our world, but um, in the sense of the use of uh, this use of the word, um, we would be what people call dispensational, as that word's usually used, meaning we recognize different dispensations or different administrations or different rules of the house. 
different ways that things are managed in different eras. So you can think of a dispensation as a period of Bible history, past or future, which is in a certain sense distinguished from the era before it and the era after it. So here's your mini course in dispensations. The major transitions from one era to another, when there's a big change, when there's new revelation given, here are the main ones. Okay, and you, you can find dispensationalists that will argue over whether there are two dispensations, three dispensations, six dispensations, seven dispensations, 12 dispensations, or a Coke dispensing machine. I'm not sure how many all of them have. But nobody can argue with these. Here are big change points in human history. Uh, the fall, it was things were different before and after sin came into the world. The flood, things are different before and after the flood. The giving of the Mosaic Law, that was a big one. The life, death, and resurrection of Christ, that's huge. The coming of the Holy Spirit, that's huge. That's huge. The rapture of the church when God removes the church from the earth, that's huge. Then seven years later, the second coming, that's huge. Ultimately, there's the, I didn't even put in here, the millennial kingdom, the thousand-year reign, and then there's the, the, the new heaven and the new earth. Now, here's the idea. There are various terms applied to these eras between those events, and dispensationalists differ on how to label them. Uh, we, we essentially, we live in the area, era that is best described as the, uh, the dispensation of grace. We stand in the, the grace of God. But the most essential understanding of dispensationalism is recognizing that there's a difference between the church and the nation of Israel, that they are distinct. The, uh, Israel is not swallowed up by the church, and the church is not the, 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 the new version of, uh, of Israel. God will fulfill all of His promises to Israel eventually in the millennial kingdom. So there are those points of transition and change. There are different eras with different... Um, rules in a force, if you will. There are always many things, most things carried over from one dispensation to the next, but there are always new things that are, uh, that are added. And some of those um, nullify some of the things that were in force before them. But as you look at all those points of transition and change, understand this is all one continuous unfolding of the plan of redemption. And if you exegete each passage on its own and then you put them all together, you observe both the amazing unity and continuity within the Bible as well as certain discontinuity as the plan unfolds. Both of those things are true. Now, you say, I thought he was in Ephesians but he headed somewhere for the desert south of Mount Home. Okay, what I want you to see is that this word, translated administration here, King James translates it dispensation four of the six times that it occurs. It's a slightly different form of the word that's usually translated steward or stewardship. The verb form means to manage. It's not used primarily as a period of time. But that word has been adopted that way, so we'll use it when we talk about dispensations. The component parts of the word translated administration are house, as I said, and manage. So the New American Standard captures well the sense of this word with our word administration or house rules. This means that there is an administration by God of a certain period of human history in which we happen to live. It speaks of the ways that God works in and through all of the events of all of the peoples of all of the era, eras of human history to fulfill His will. So, we have redemption in Christ, back to verse 10, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times 
That's referring to Christ's coming. That is the summing up of all things in Christ, which goes on through the tribulation time and the kingdom time, things in the heavens and things on earth. So he's talking about when Christ came and subsequent to them, we to them, we have redemption. Summing up is a one of those fancy words in Greek. It's a polysyllabic word. I think it's about six syllables long. It's a translation of one Greek word, the core of which is the word for head. And the idea is of it all coming together again under one head in Christ. So our redemption is all about the plan of God in Christ to bring everything together. We're part of that now in the church. But there's even more to come in the future. We're going to see that uh, later in the chapter. We're going to see that later uh, several more times in Ephesians. So the key word today is redemption. Here's your overview of redemption from Ephesians 1, 7 through 10. The meaning, we've been purchased out of slavery to sin. The person of redemption obviously is Christ. He's the one who did the redeeming. The price of redemption is nothing less than his life or his death, depending on how you want to view it. The result of redemption is the forgiveness of sins. The source of redemption is God's grace. You didn't do anything to redeem yourself. You can't do anything to redeem yourself because, well, you're not perfect, and it requires the perfect sacrifice. The outcome of redemption is that God is in the process of bringing everything together under Christ. So, what do you do about it? Well, please don't go home and say, oh, well, what a great verse that is in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. It is a great sentence. It is a great collection. But what are you supposed to do about it? Well, remember those two verses I read you at the beginning where Paul used that basic word, uh, agorazo, about buying something in the marketplace Remember, they were both in, both in 1 Corinthians, and 1 Corinthians was amazingly written to the church at Corinth. Corinth was so messed up that when Chuck Swindoll started preaching on 1 Corinthians, he called it 1 Californians. <laughs> Think of people that, you know, they, they've heard the gospel, they believe, but they still have a whole lot to figure out about what to do with it. So here's what to do with the doctrine of redemption. 1 Corinthians 6.20, for you have been bought with a price. Therefore, this is what you're supposed to do about it, glorify God in your body. Glorify God in how you live on this earth. Now, how do you do that? Well, you might even say, based on the mercies of God, present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, because that's what God wants you to do. Realize it's a free gift. You didn't contribute anything to your redemption. You can't contribute anything. All the work is accomplished by God through what Christ did on the cross. You need to receive the redemption that is in Christ. How many slaves do you think had served a cruel master who then decided to sell them to somebody else and somebody comes along and says, okay, I want to pay the price for that one and that one and that one and then say, okay, you're free to go? How many of them do you think would say, no, nah, I kind of like this cage? No, you've received your redemption. So glorify God in your in your body. You've received redemption in Christ so that you can now live a redeemed life. And He even gives you the power to live the redeemed life by putting His Holy Spirit within you. You just need to receive the free gift, if you will. In our daily studies through the Gospel of John, you remember this a couple of weeks ago, John 1, 1, uh, John 1 12 and 13. 
And it says in verse 11 that he came to his own world that he created, his own people rejected them, but he said, rejected him, but he says, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Remember last time we talked about adoption? As that's what we are elected to, if you will. We become the adopted children of God. To those who believe in His name, you will become His, His children. So now that you understand redemption, if it's the cry of your heart to have this and you don't, then tell that to God. Ask Him to give you the free gift Ask Him to invade your life in the person of Christ. Tell Him you don't any longer want to be a slave to your sin. He will do what He's promised. You will be the recipient of redemption. Oh, and everything else that's described as every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Him. My friends, <laughs> we're redeemed. We've been set free. Let's glorify God in how we live. And let's pray. Our Father, thank You that we can come to You in the name of Your Son, knowing that we stand in Him, knowing that um, we have all the riches of Your grace that You have lavished upon us in Christ. Father, please don't let someone go away from here still choosing bondage rather than freedom in the Savior. And Father, there are people all around us who need to hear the message. Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Put that message on our lips and give us opportunity Give us boldness to speak the truth in love to those who most desperately need us. And Father, may our redeemed lives provoke people around us to ask about our Redeemer because it is all for His glory and it is only by His power that we could ever be instruments of spreading Your grace. So use us to that end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.